by uh, the Dumanian family. Um, uh, so we are very lucky at this university, at the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, that annually uh, we have funding uh, to invite a visiting professor from here at NELC and teach a course in Armenian studies. Um, uh, and uh, this has been going on um, for 25 plus years, at least before my time. And uh, this is yet another year that uh, we had a visiting professor, uh, Tobin Albandian, um, <coughs> to deliver uh, a to teacher class. And some of you are meeting in that class. Um, and then this is a public lecture. And that's another tradition that whenever we have a uh, visiting professor, uh, uh, then we have a public lecture, which is open to everyone in the university community as well as outside um, for the Armenian community or you know anyone that hears about this. Um, so that's, that's a great um, tradition that we are keeping um, on. Um, uh, so uh, we are thankful very much to uh, Mrs. Jumanian and the Jumanian Foundation Endowment um, that they are uh, permitting uh, uh, to make this um, come true. Um, and uh, now maybe I'll, I'll give a, a microphone uh, <laughs> to Holly Schisler, who is uh, the current director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Hi, everybody. I won't be too long-winded because we won't pile on too many introductions on top of the introductions. But uh, just to, uh, to uh, first of all, I want to make a quick announcement, which is to say, as, as most of you can probably see, we are filming. Uh, so this session is being recorded. Um, the camera is trained on the speakers, but the audio is being taken as well. If, so just so that you're aware, if you ask a question, it will be on the tape. Um, and that's just in the interest of informed consent and all that. Um, having said that, I want to say what a pleasure it is for me, again, to be able to introduce another of our uh, Dumanian visiting professors. Uh, the, uh, the endowment that the Dumanian family has uh, uh, provided to the Department of American Languages and Civilizations has, over a period of many years, sustained uh, Armenian studies at this university, uh, and together with the very rich offerings that Professor Hotunian offers in uh, language and culture of Armenia, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to have a wide array of scholars from all over the world really come uh, as visitors to speak about Armenian history, culture, literature, uh, painting, uh, social <laughs> life, uh, whatever it is. Uh, architecture has, has been a, a source of enormous enrichment uh, uh, for the institution. And important for Armenian studies, but they, I also want to say that uh, something that I feel truly and sincerely, which is that it has been so important for broadening and deepening the scope of what Middle Eastern studies are. Uh, uh, and that truly, if one is interested in the history of the Levant or of the Ottoman Empire or of the Caucasus, uh, uh, you can't have a, a meaningful uh, and complete picture uh, of that history of civilization without, or Iran too, obviously, without fully integrating uh, the story of the Armenian people uh, into that uh, tapestry. So, um, uh, so we're extremely uh, pleased uh, to be able to carry on uh, this uh, tradition of having a visiting um, professor. And this year's visiting professor I'm about to introduce to you, having threatened to not be lonely and be more women, uh, or promised to not be more women, uh, is uh, Professor Sonia Nalbanya, who comes to us uh, from the uh, Department of Modern Middle Eastern uh, Studies at Leiden University, and more specifically from the Institute for Area Studies there. Uh, she has a, a PhD from Columbia University. And she is particular, and her particular focus or her particular area of interest is looking at the Armenian community in Syria and Lebanon, uh, and thinking about the impact of, uh, and thinking. Uh, I guess I'm describing this, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, describing two things really: one, the the importance of 
a diaspora community in, in shaping uh, one's uh, experience, identity, and sense of oneself in the world as a community and as an individual. And on the other hand, asking the question, what do these so-called diasporic communities contribute, uh, or what happened to the formation of, of uh, national identity in the major nation states? So the typical approach is, generally speaking, to you know, if you think about you know, Turkey as the land of the Turks, or uh, Lebanon is a country inhabited by Arabs, and to think about other communities as somehow minority communities or marginal communities uh, who have interesting histories, but uh, whose stories don't have to tell us about the formation of the, of the predominant national identity of that country. And I think that, that Professor Malcolm has been things to complicate that story for us and to point out to us the ways in which uh, uh, the, the sort of creation of minority status, the creation of, of, dia of diaspora as a mental category, uh, 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 the creation of marginalized groups within any particular political structure, is an integral part of creating not only the identity of those groups, but also an integral part of creating the identity of the larger group. Um, and I think that's a, a, a very textured uh, and nuanced uh, approach to history and an important contribution to the way we think about citizenship, nation state, building, nationalism, uh, and so forth. Uh, I believe that in this uh, talk, uh, as in some of other works, we'll be focusing on the period of decolonization uh, in uh, uh, Lebanon and greater Syria. And uh, having said all that, it's really my great pleasure to uh, give her the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think you took my notes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. No, no, no problem. <laughs> yeah, let's see what happens. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, sorry, let me just start this again. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Haribsman uh, Holly. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I just want to take a moment to also thank the Dumanian family whose support has allowed me um, to be here this quarter and also for their continued support in the field of Armenian studies here at the University of Chicago. Um, I also really have to thank everyone at the NELK department and in particular uh, Franklin Lewis, um, Nadine Mueller, um, Holly Schisler, Amina Dresen, and Amanda Young who who've helped me get here. Um, and the, humanity fa the humanities faculty also really helped facilitate this appointment, so thank you. And I'm just um, really you know, grateful for your help and excited to be part of this. So my talk today will highlight some of the themes and issues that I've been dealing with over the past few years while discussing how Armenians made Lebanon their own, following the country's independence in the 1940s and 1950s. I'm going to discuss three cases. Uh, one is the 1946-1949 the repatriation movement, the organized transfer of Armenians to the Soviet Republic of Armenia. The second is the 1956 Catholicos election in Beirut that resulted in the selection of Zadeh, a fervent anti-Soviet figure. And the third is the intra-Armenian violence that took place during the larger civil strife of 1958, which resulted in the territorialization of Armenian inhabited neighborhoods in Beirut. These and other cases discussed in my forthcoming book historiographically intervene in three fields, Armenian, Lebanese, and Cold War history. My talk will not address these historiographic interventions per se, but I'm happy to broach the topic in the Q&A that follows. Despite the genocide and even after it, Armenians did know thriving centers, politically, socially, and culturally, ideologically, and ecclesiastically. Lebanon, and in particular its capital city of Beirut, were a particular important center. The power that Armenians articulated in the everyday in Lebanon made it an apex of Armenian authority, pulling local, regional, and transnational Armenians into its orbit. At the same time, I will show what we can learn about Lebanon and the Arab world more broadly by looking at the everyday experiences of Armenian sociopolitics. Before I begin, I think it's quite useful to just provide you with a brief historical background. 
So while the genocide condemned surviving Armenians to a life outside of Anatolia and destroyed Istanbul as the center of Armenian economic and cultural life, it had other effects too. For one, in Lebanon and specifically in Beirut, the remnants of Armenian communities hailing from myriad points all across Anatolia, with the vast majority hailing from Cilicia, gathered in one single space. So this is just a, a quick map of Cilicia, and this is where I would say the majority of Armenians in Lebanon hailed from. The geography of Anatolia was radically compressed into one city, Beirut, having far-reaching socio-political and cultural effects. What had been multiple Armenian communities back in the Ottoman Empire's vast lands grew into a community in New York, in Beirut. Early on, after World War I, this process was facilitated by France, Lebanon's mandate rulers from 1918 to 1946. A key event in this regard came in 1924, when the French included Armenian inhabitants of Lebanon in the new mandate citizenship law. That particular French act has a negative effect, as it were. It legally nixed, or at least drastically reduced, the chance that Armenians would return to their former homes back in Anatolia. After all, they were now citizens of another national space. This citizenship, had, this citizenship Act had a positive, constructive effect too. It created the legal and by extension political framework for the recentering of much of Armenian life in and on Lebanon. So just a quick map of Lebanon and Syria prior to independence and then post-independence. It was not homogeneous though, quite the opposite. Armenian life was extremely heterogeneous and in a much more high energy, involved, boisterous, vociferous, and even conflict-ridden way than Anatolia's Armenian communities had been. Beirut was not simply the largest concentration of Armenians in the Arab world, with over, with over 70,000 Armenians out of a population of 1.1 million in Lebanon by 1944. As important, the Arab East's most thriving city from the mid-19th century provided an energizing environment for political parties, church institutions, newspapers, and eventually radio stations, and lay people to interact in the everyday in unprecedented ways. And yet, at the same time, the presence of Armenian political parties in Lebanon marked a distinct continuity to late Ottoman times. The nationalist Dashnaks, the two leftist organizations, the Hunchaks and the Ramgavars, were rooted in the ideologies of the late Ottoman liberal reform period and concerned with Armenians' condition in the empire's peripheries, most notably in Anatolia. These three parties and the Armenian Communist Party that entertained close relations to Lebanon's and Syria's Communist Party modified their political platforms and adjusted to the new political theater of Lebanon. Given the country's sectarian system, after independence, Armenians were guaranteed political power and these four parties jockeyed with one another for it. So let me now turn to my first case, the repatriation movement. I'll start again with really quick background. On December 5, 1945, the Soviet news agency TASS announced the establishment of the Repatriation Commission, the organized drive to collect all worldwide Armenians and return them to the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic. And return is the language in which they used. While there were other prominent repatriation centers in the Middle East, including Aleppo, Damascus, and Tehran, over one-third of the more than 100,000 Armenians worldwide who repatriated to the Soviet Republic traveled via Beirut or came from it, which made Lebanon's capital the most central origin and staging point for the repatriation initiative. Lebanese newspapers in Arabic, Armenian, and French dedicated their entire front page to the first caravan departure on June 22, 1946, and the word caravan was also used in the press. The ships, uh, they were named the Russia and the Transylvania, and these were old German cargo ships that had been recommissioned by the Soviet Union after World War II, um, alternated transporting Armenians from Karantina, which is the port of Beirut, through the Turkish Straits to the Soviet Georgian port of Batumi, 
where they boarded trains to their final destination, the capital of the US, uh, the capital of the Soviet Republic of Armenia in Yerevan. So just a few photos I'm gonna show you just so you can get the feeling of the repatriation. Um, so this is on top of the ship, uh, aboard the ship rather, and there are these children and it says in Armenian, thank you, Father Stalin, we're, com we're coming uh, to the homeland, your children. This is another photo um, of the Russia. That, so there were two ships that alternated. So you can also see the spectacle and the crowds gathered also on the port that are not repatriating as well. Um, here you can see the masses, just so you have an idea of the numbers there. And also here you can see, it almost looks like it's going to tip, but it's a real photo. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, this, is, um, this is an interesting photo in particular in that um, this is aboard the ship, of course, but um, two different, uh, one is written in, in Arabic, the other uh, placard is written in Armenian, and they say different things. So um, the one in Armenian is talking about um, basically thanking um, uh, the Lebanese and the Syrians um, and saying like long live an independent sovereign Lebanon and Syria. Um, and then the other uh, Armenian um, placard is talking about the university students of, well the university age students of uh, the repatriates and how they are thanking um, uh, Father Stalin and um, you know our uh, our beloved Soviet Armenia. So the story itself of the repatriation drive has been told before by historians and in memoirs. Rather than rehashing the details of the story, then I want to focus on the Lebanese Armenian political cultural understandings of repatriation. How did this initiative form a chapter of Lebanese and the other Middle Eastern Armenians review, revision, and re negotiation of national belonging in the early post-colonial times? The emerging Cold War was more than a backdrop to this repatriation story. Moscow's initiative made repatriation possible in the first place. After all, it was the USSR that announced the initiative to unite Armenians from all around the world to the Soviet Armenian Republic that organized the transport of tens of thousands of Armenians to the USSR and then allowed them to enter the country and then housed them in the Soviet Republic and made them Soviet citizens. Also, the Soviet initiative was a victory vis-a-vis -vis the USSR rivals. At a time of peace, citizens of some countries voluntarily sold their belongings and moved to become part of the motherland of state socialism. But the heating up of the Cold War and the very divergent readings of and responses to the repatriation in initiative amongst Lebanese Armenians reinforced tensions between Armenian rightists and Armenian leftists. The Lebanese example shows that Armenians' response to repatriation did not simply reflect their extent political cultural positions. Rather, repatriation sharpened those positions. As other Armenian newspapers worldwide began to publicize the repatriation movement, Jorovurtitsain, and this is Beirut's communist Armenian daily, positioned itself as a global source of news for the repatriation efforts. On March 6, 1946, Jorovurti Tsain ran a translated copy of an article from the February 18 edition of the Aleppo Arabic daily Al Hawadith, which covered the repatriation registrations there. Reprinting articles from various press outlets transformed Jorovurti Tsain as a vehicle of information about Armenian communities outside of Lebanon and directed attention of their activities to the readership inside Lebanon. As it supported and covered the global movement of Armenians to the Soviet Union, it reinforced Lebanon as a gathering source of information for Armenians. Covering the departure of repatriates from Damascus to Beirut, and there they, they came by railway, Jorovurti Tsain mentioned the dignitaries who were present at the station to see the repatriates off, so at the railway station. Soviet members of the repatriation committee, representatives of the Soviet Armenian government, numerous priests, the prelate of the Armenian Church of Damascus, so he would be the bishop of the Armenian Church of Damascus, and members of the local Damascus Committee for Repatriation. 
The article then also noted that before the train departed the station, all of those gathered together and in unison sang first the Syrian national anthem, followed by the anthem of the Soviet Republic, and that the excitement and applause was unparalleled. The chairperson of Damascus's repatriation committee also thanked not only, quote, the Soviet Union, great Stalin, and the great Russian people, but also the Syrian people who, quote, looked upon us like brothers, end quote, and expressed gratitude to the Syrian government and president. It's indeed interesting that while Armenians were Syrian citizens and had been so since the days of the French mandate, the chairperson categorized them like brothers as opposed to brothers themselves. This distinction echoed Jorovurtitsain's positioning of Syria and, and Lebanon for that matter as a temporary shelter rather than a permanent home. This was doubly peculiar given that Syria's Armenian communists were an integral part of the country's communist party and that in the Middle East as elsewhere, ethnic divisions weren't supposed to count too much in communist parlance and practice. Still, even though Jorovurtitsain worked to reinforce a separation between Armenians and in this case Syrians, its description of the emotional scene also demonstrated that the parting was not straightforward or natural. Quote, the departure was very emotional for both the repatriates and for those who had gathered, end quote stated. While these moving expressions could be testimony to the painful separation of the Armenian community in Syria, with a part repatriating, a part remaining, it is likewise an expression of the movement of Armenians from one place to another. All those gathered had not signed up to leave. The emotion was also a manifestation of loss of belonging and being of Syria. Still, there were competing imageries occurring at the same moment. Jorovurti Tsain also described the long-standing applause along with the waving handkerchiefs that could be seen for miles. It took over 15 hours or so to reach Beirut, reporting that the train arrived at 6.30 in the morning and the passengers and belongings were transferred to the port under the guidance of Beirut's repatriation committee. Finally, departure scenes in the port of Beirut too reflected the intertwined Armenian with Lebanese identities. Once all the repatriates of the first caravan to the USSR had boarded the ship, they began to sing the Lebanese national anthem, Jorovurti Tsain reported. The role played by the Catholicos of the Cilician Sea, so he would be the highest figure of the Armenian Apostolic Church of that sea. It's headquartered in Antilias in, near Beirut, and it's one of the most powerful uh, independent ecclesiastic units of the Orthodox Armenian world. His presence at the port and also on the ship also added yet another layer to the continually complex relationship between Armenians and Lebanon, even as and when some were departing. The Catholicos was present during the ship's departure. He boarded it, toured it, and blessed those on board. This quintessentially religious act demonstrated an intimate bond with those who were about to leave his congregations. Indeed, it suggested approval of their act, although that act was removing them from his circle and worse to a country whose very ideology was non-religious, if not decidedly anti-religious. But while the Catholicos blessed those aboard and while he identified the destination of the ship as our homeland, and our is used, not the word homeland, its citizens that their, its citizens, their brothers, he made sure not to revert to the Soviet Republic of Armenia or to the leader of the USSR, Stalin. His words neither mentioned a final homecoming, nor were they particularly instructive for this apparent historic moment. Quote, I want you to be worthy citizens in this new country in which you will live. Be hardworking and reliable, because these are the ways to show your love for your country and be ideal citizens, end quote. In fact, the Catholicos reclaimed those very repatriates moments before they leave Lebanon for good. Quote, Dear ones, I do not want to hear that within the Lebanese repatriates there are bastards, thieves, scoundrels, and wicked travelers. Just as you are model citizens here, I want you to be the same with your brothers there. End quote. The Catholicos continued to claim his congregants transnationally, beyond all borders, even as he blessed their very departure.
While such a transnational claim was hardly new for the Armenian church, its centers had never adhered to imperial or nation-state boundaries. Katholikoi had not, had not claimed authority over congregations within another sea's jurisdiction, which is exactly what he symbolically did do here. For this Catholicos, those Armenian repatriates remain symbols of and tied to Lebanon. As he put it, addressing the repatriates on the ship, excuse me, quote, continue to be grateful to this homeland that you are leaving. Remember that it was these people, referring to the Lebanese, who welcomed you in your time of need and soothed your suffering. Remember this homeland with gratitude, end quote. Repatriation intended to unify worldwide Armenians and organize them within one national space, the Soviet Republic of Armenia. Armenians used the concepts surrounding repatriation, including the question of the location of the homeland and the actions of repatriating, to challenge one another's political ideology in a bid over power. That these battles occurred in Lebanon located a nation-building project there that simultaneously had transnational consequences. In fact, Lebanon became the confluence of various Armenian issues, including the return of formerly Armenian populated areas of Anatolia. As the departure point for Syrian and Lebanese repatriates, it likewise became the site of imagination for the idealized Armenian who would go on to serve the Armenian nation, be it in the Soviet Republic or not. So I'm gonna move on now to the second case. In 1952, Catholicos Karekin, so he was the Catholicos who boarded and blessed these repatriation ships, he passed away. For four years, his seat remained vacant. Finally, in early 1956, the Cilician Sea, again, this is um, in Antilias, near Beirut, decided to go through with the Catholicos election. The run-up to the event was pretty dramatic. Vaskin, he was the Catholicos of the Ichmiadzin Sea, so he would be the highest figure of that sea located in the Soviet Republic, visited Lebanon in a rather undisguised attempt to influence the election outcome. To no avail, on February 20, the Cilician Sea's bishops chose as a new Catholicos an outspoken critic of communism and the USSR, Zare. So that's a photo of, of him. When Vaskin, so he's again the, the head of the Armenian church, the Catholicos of Echmiadzin in the Soviet Republic, landed in Beirut on February 12, he was greeted by tens of thousands of Armenians lining the streets from the airport just south of Beirut to the monastery in Antilias that was about 15 kilometers away to the capital's north. So just a photo of the scene, I think you can make it out, the scene of the arrival, this is actually on, it's actually on the tarmac of Beirut's old airport. Um, and this is another photo, so you can get a sense of the crowds that are excited and greeting him. Indeed, in the volatile political atmosphere of the juncture, Vaskin's visit elicited great interest among the city's Armenians. And while the Armenian population in Lebanon did not formally participate in the electoral process, many joined in planned and spontaneous public events throughout the capital city. Starting at the airport, they lined the streets welcoming Vaskin and followed him en masse to meetings with Armenian church officials and Lebanese politicians and officials. This unprecedented level of popular involvement by Armenians, together with continuing media coverage, highlighted that a decade into Lebanon's independence, the country's Armenians were at ease with making the capital city's public space their own. They did not really feel like marginal and weak subjects. They had ceased thinking of themselves firstly as fresh off the boat refugees who better keep a low profile in order to not to attract undue attention. They showed up in force not only in their own neighborhoods, places like in Nantilias or Burj Hamoud, but also in supra-ethnic, religious, secular public spaces like Beirut's airport and the roads connecting the airport to the Beirut center. Did Vaskin shift from a Soviet authority into an Armenian one during this journey? It was unclear where the jurisdiction of his person as a Soviet authority ended and where the Armenian began. Be that as it may, the Armenian public's support of Vaskin as either or both a Soviet or Armenian official sidestepped the Lebanese nation state. After all, while only some Armenians welcomed Vaskin because they were leftists and he a Soviet representative, 
Most, if not all, those who packed Beirut's airport and lined the city streets on February 12 and 13 did so because Vasken's arrival was a rather momentous chapter in Armenian history. This was the first time since the creation of the USSR that Vasken, the Catholicos of the Echmiadzin Sea, was allowed to leave Soviet territory and directly meet Armenians elsewhere. This was doubly crucial because the Echmiadzin Sea was not some unimportant second rank ecclesiastic unit. It was the, you know, the self-anointed mother sea whose keystone church was the first cathedral built in post-conversion Armenia. Moreover, even as the Armenian response to Vaskin's visit highlighted how much Armenians were comfortable using Lebanese public space, it simultaneously showed how much they thought it necessary to identify and be identified as Lebanese of Armenian confession, rather than simply Armenians. To be sure, Armenian political party figures, newspapers, and members of the public all participated in the spectacle of Vaskin's visit. Armenian schools were closed, and the established Committee to Welcome, uh, Committee to Welcome Catholicos Vasken encouraged students to line the streets from the National Museum of Lebanon to the bridges that led to, into Burchamud, out of respect for the Catholicos. But this directive was publicized by the Armenian newspapers, along with five instructions. The third one announced, the only flag that is permitted to be held is the flag of the Lebanese state. Although this, the directive did not elaborate on the significance of alternative flags, it clearly deemed the Lebanese flag the only exclusively appropriate symbol for representing Lebanon's Armenians as they welcomed Vaskin. To give that metaphorical screw one more turn, one may argue that the Armenian citizens of Lebanon Armenianized the Lebanese flag. It became an Armenian symbol, albeit one loyal to Lebanon, that demonstrated their approval with the visit by an official of the Echmiadzin Sea who was simultaneously a Soviet official. The events of February 12-13 then transcended the, boundary, the bounded notions of the nation state. Where the authority of Lebanon and the USSR began, ended, overlapped, was ambiguous. And so was Lebanese Armenian self-identification. Further, the events of the February 12-13 did not simply reflect an already extant complex configuration of the religious national identities by Christian Armenian citizens of Lebanon. Rather, they helped shape the ways in which said multiple identities were expressed in public, including the ambiguity of using Lebanese flags and the self-confidence on display as Armenians thronged the airport and the avenues from there to Antilles. So on Sunday, February 19, 1956, the day before the rescheduled elections, Vaskin made another new and this time squarely religious attempt to assert his authority and extend it over the congregations of the Cilician Sea. He did so by performing Sunday Mass, including a sermon in the very compound of the Cilician Sea in Antilias. While the announcement that he would officiate mass was printed on the front page of all of Lebanon's Armenian newspapers, the newspaper affiliated with the Dashnak party, so that's the rightist nationalist party, did not cover the event, signaling disapproval. At this point, that newspaper became more persistent in attacking Vaskin's presence. It called him a foreigner, a Soviet pawn, implying that he was neither privy to nor aware of the intricacies of Armenian life and politics in Lebanon. Opponents of the elections did not limit their actions to Armenian structures. Others who opposed the choice of Zare took to the streets. Some attacked archbishops, causing them to be hospitalized. A number of women who had participated in the takeover of the monastery structure, attempting to delay the election, also attempted to meet the Lebanese President Shamoun. While they were unsuccessful, they did manage to deliver a letter explaining their opposition and imploring the president to take action and nullify the election. In the letter, these women connected their appeal to the Lebanese president to their legal status as Lebanese citizens and declared the necessity for him to become involved as the leader of their homeland. As the women's group attempted to use their legal status as Lebanese citizens to compel the state to intervene on their behalf, the Lebanese state too saw fit to do so. 
It did so, however, on the side of the party allied with Shamoun, the Dashnak, so the, the rightist uh, nationalist party, who supported the anti-communist Zare. The Lebanese state made an official declaration backing the New Catholicos and reinforced troops guarding the Antilias complex against Zare's opponents. So this is just a, a photo of the crowds gathered uh, throughout these few days. There were always crowds that were gathered here at the monastery complex. And um, up on the upper left, you can see two Lebanese soldiers, um, but they were actually stationed throughout the complex. Other states acted too, and did so in a way that demonstrated how much an Armenian ecclesiastic election had become politicized, and how that politicization reflected Cold War fault lines within and beyond the Armenian community. Numerous dignitaries from Western states, including Great Britain, France, and the US, offered their congratulations. And Jordan continued to refuse Vaskin an entry visa to Jerusalem. By contrast, the Soviet Union and other Warsaw Pact countries expressed dismay. And yet another, um, other Middle Eastern states entered the fray. Cairo invited Vaskin to organize his Emergency Council of Bishops meeting, which he had initially had planned to hold in Jerusalem, in Egypt's capital. Lebanon's, Jordan's, and Egypt's different reactions to the election and their differing treatment of Vaskin reflected their different relationships with the USSR and the US in the Cold War. States sought to assert their sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis ecclesiastic Armenian matters that happened on their territory. Thus, the Lebanese president and in excuse me, the Lebanese state, and in particular Shamoun, was involved politically and symbolically in the 1956 Catholicos election. But states also tried to use Armenian issues and religious Armenian bodies, whose authority was non-secular and whose reach was not quite bound by nation-state borders to affect third country's politics. The foremost example is the present, in the present case was the Soviet attempt to meddle in the 1956 election in the person of Vaskin, the Catholicos of the Echmiadzin Sea, which was headquartered in the Soviet Republic. In sum then, the 1956 election allows us to look at the Cold War in the Middle East, not from the top down through the eyes of Washington or Moscow or Lebanon or Egypt, during flashpoints like the 1958 US intervention in Lebanon or the US and Soviet reactions to the tripartite aggression against Egypt in 1956. Rather, in that election, Armenians made use of Cold War tensions to designate a leader of the Armenian church who was seen to suit the community's interests. That story also expanded historians understanding uh, the historian's understanding of Lebanon's Armenians, from refugees and outsiders in national politics to true participants whose own internal politics, moreover, were of interest to Lebanon's authorities, and who by now felt free to invade and use public spaces beyond their own neighborhoods to make political statements. So now I'm going to move on to my last uh, case. So as aforementioned, Lebanese President Kamil Shamoun, openly, uh, his openly pro-Western orientation created considerable tensions in Lebanon. His, divis his divisive stance, together with increased social disparities in the wake of the Gulf oil boom and the influx of Palestinian refugees, created a toxic social, political, and economic environment in Lebanon. In this fraught situation, and in a desperate attempt to hold on to power, in 1957, he used irregular and corrupt parliamentary elections in which his party and its allies, including the Armenian Dashnak party, so the rightist nationalist party, triumphed. To push through an unpopular bid to extend his presidency by an additional term starting the following year. While the election outcome did not trigger violence, political rivalries hardened. The assassination of the editor of the major opposition newspaper, El Telegraf, on May 8, 1958, led to a nationwide general strike that escalated into a civil war that lasted until October. With the exception of parts of Beirut and the Mount Lebanon governorate, Lebanon was under rebel control for five months. So this is just the, the uh, front page of the Daily English newspaper. By mid-July, 15,000 U.S. troops were present in Lebanon, 
backed by another 40,000 on 70 warships of the U.S. Navy's Sixth Fleet to provide military assistance. Beirut and the airport were secured within days, essentially ending the civil strife. Negotiations to end the fighting between govern government figures and the opposition were predicated upon the agreement to choose an acceptable successor to Shamoun. Fuad Shihab, the head of the Lebanese army, emerged as the best choice, garnering support from all sides of the conflict. A national pact was signed on October 17, uh, 1958, and American troops left the country by the end of October. So that's a photo of the newly elected, well, he wasn't elected, the chosen uh, Fuad Shihab. And it's funny because they must have made a prop, like they must have made a mistake in the print, but it already went to print. <laughs> um, Armenian parties participated in and, con and contributed to the events of 1957 and 1958. Simultaneously, they used their position within the Lebanese political system to jostle for power within the Armenian community. They were Lebanized, one may say. This development turned violent and came to a close only in December 1958, almost two months after the Lebanese mini-civil war had ended, when the Lebanese army intervened. The Lebanese state then likewise Armenianized in that it started to pay more attention to Armenian matters than before, intervening directly and by military force in Armenian neighborhoods by December 1958 in order to end the internecine Armenian confrontation. And while Armenians were Lebanized, they also, more than other confessions in Lebanon, were very strongly by 1958 mortally internally divided along political lines. These tensions and violent confrontations between Armenian parties and their armed men had a crucial spatial effect. They, excuse me, they unprecedentedly territorialized parts of Beirut. To be sure, parts of Lebanon were already organized by sect and class. By relative contrast, it was according to political party affiliation that in 1957-1958, many Armenians of Mar Mikhail, Senelfil, Burj Hamoud, and Cornish al Nahar were resorted and relocated, often by force. This was the second time in less than a decade that, especially in Beirut, the political profile of Lebanese Armenians changed considerably. By the 1950s, Armenians lived in various neighborhoods of Beirut. While neighborhoods were roughly segregated by class, Armenians of different political and religious persuasions lived in them. Armenian Orthodox and Catholic churches were established within walking distance from one another. In Burj Hamoud and in downtown, Armenian schools administered by the headquarters of either the Armenian Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant churches also enjoyed a diverse student body. For example, the majority of students in the Armenian Evangelical College, it's an Armenian Protestant institution located in, in, in Kantari in, in Beirut, were members of the Armenian Catholic and Orthodox churches. The community centers of Armenian political parties were no different. They were located near one another, they attracted children and adults from the neighborhood, and were not always rigid regarding membership and affiliation. Thus, while youth from the neighborhood often joined a sports team affiliated with a political party, they or their parents were not necessarily party members. Rather, they chose a team for its sport of success and quality. As part of Lebanon's broader crisis in 1957 and 1958 then, specific Armenian Beiruti neighborhoods began to stand for particular imaginations of belonging and articulating citizenship in Lebanon. This territorialization, as it were, of Armenian neighborhoods like Mar Mikhail, Burj Hamoud, Senalfil, and Ramel were new. Prior to 1958, Beirut's Armenian, Arabic, and Francophone press alike collectively described these areas as the Armenian neighborhoods. But by early 1958, the Armenian press talked of the Salid Burj Hamoud, the violent Burj Hamoud, the suffering of Cornish al Nahar, the, pre the penetrated Hajan, Nur Hajan under siege. Arabic Lebanese newspapers did not reproduce these fissures, but continued to use the generic term the Armenian areas or the Armenian neighborhoods. The armed blockade of these neighborhoods made it hard for outsiders to enter them, at least temporarily marginalizing them within Beirut and setting them off from the 
quarters in their, re in their readers' imagination. Even when the Lebanese military was deployed, the obstruction of space continued. For example, the Armenian church in Rumel was forcibly closed, allegedly by Dashnak party adherents, so that's the rightist nationalist party, irrespective of the Lebanese military and police forces who were supposed to aid in its reopening. As for Armenians' treatment in, of, Be of Beiruti Armenian spaces, it was not only the Dashnaks who segregated them discursively, the Hunchak press did so too. Covering the murder of five Armenians, for example, it described how skilled criminals from that neighborhood, and it was understood as referring to Burj Hamoud, crossed the river from Senelfil, committed their crimes, and then crossed back to that neighborhood. At the same time, neither the paper nor presumably its readership felt the need to explicitly identify or state where the border was located, demonstrating that Armenian Beirutis shared an understanding of where neighborhood borders lay in the city. Armenian parties also used the editorial pages to lambast one another and accuse one another of murdering true Armenian patriots. For the Hunchaks, and that's a leftist party, the Dashnak party held the Armenian people hostage, and even the Lebanese military could not save them. That's a quotation. Perhaps the inability of the Lebanese state institutions to do so, however, was related to their lack of knowledge of the entry and exit points of their new demarcations. On the other hand, to the Dashnak party, the Lebanese state was working on behalf of its supporters. After the murder of Dashnak member and athlete Kevork Boskerichan in Hajin, Astag, and that's the paper of the Dashnak party, reported that the Lebanese army arrived at the scene and transported him to Hotel Dio Hospital. The intervention of the Lebanese army and not of a Lebanese civil service, such as the police or ambulatory, indicated that the state feared the political nature and fallout of the intra-Armenian violence. As for the Dashnaks, it framed the state's intervention as a validation of their campaign against their, against their Armenian rivals. The army, they said, came to save the Armenian athlete, and in doing so, intervened on behalf of the Dashnak political party and against the, against the aggression of its rival political party who had allegedly staged the operation. In fact, the Dashnak party began to rely more and more on the Lebanese army. When Hagop Kushkerian was murdered in Hajin the day after Voskerichan, the Lebanese army once again negotiated for Hagop's body to be released and be brought into Burchamud. The army arbitra arbitrated the removal of the victim's body. It had, entered a it had entered a district where its power, while respected, was also somewhat foreign. It indeed had sought permission to enter and then was compelled to barricade the area in order to do so, treating the neighborhood as a hostile and autonomous space. The act of moving the body, too, shows how quarters had become territorialized. The attack occurred in Hajin, just south of Burj Hamoud and, and, in, and in Mar Mikhail, and the body was meant to be moved to Burj Hamoud. They're less than a kilometer apart, but these two quarters were identified as very different Armenian centers. The violence continued for weeks and was so pervasive that certain newspapers were forced to halt the publication of their, uh, of their newspaper for almost three weeks. By November, Nor Hajin was completely blockaded. The Hunchak party, the leftist party, reported that the inhabitants were, quote, living in a quarter of fear, end quote. And as the Hunchak press described the conquest of the Armenian neighborhoods as complete, the new, the new Lebanese president, Fuad Shihab, did not completely forfeit his claim of authority over the Armenian community. Hunchak's leftist paper called Zartonk detailed the ongoing and intensified Lebanese military presence in Armenian neighborhoods, describing how many rooftops were occupied by the Lebanese military and that house-to-house -house searches were quite commonplace. While the violence between spaces continued for approximately two months after the larger national cessation of hostilities, they did end by early December with an additional negotiation and declaration amongst Armenian parties brokered by the Ministry of Interior, Raymond Edde. So that's just a, a translation of the declaration in the, in the Armenian press.
The Lebanese state was eventually able to placate the warring parties, demonstrating its power. Edde's official declaration reinforced the authority of the Lebanese state by invoking the Armenian neighborhood's proximity to and in Beirut, its capital. Beirut was not to be further factionalized, or even if factionalized and polarized, the different Armenian quarters still fell under the jurisdiction of the state. Still, new facts had been created. Damage had been done. Edde's declaration also acknowledged the creation of bounded neighborhoods. His call for the immediate return of inhabitants to their own neighborhoods contradictorily acknowledged both the separation of Armenians vis-a-vis non-Armenians in Lebanon and an internal displacement. The post-genocide story of Armenians in Lebanon was to be sure a story of loss and the ingathering of very diverse populations within the small urban area of Beirut was extraordinary. But this process also helped refashion Armenian identity and power. The Lebanese case thus shows that the Armenian genocide had, in a most traumatic and tremendously tragic way, sure, regenerative consequences too. The genocide ended up being more than exclusively a source of trauma and victimhood. Historians then do not need to treat the genocide solely as an epistemological break and an end. Rather, they can discern it and in what followed, new starts and continuities, as well as breaks for the Armenian populations hailing from the Ottoman Empire. Armenians in Lebanon created and participated in an active political life that challenges traditional representations and perhaps more significantly enhances our understandings of early post-colonial, uh, of early post-colonial, early Cold War Lebanon and the inhabitants who engaged with local, regional, and transnational powers during this period. Considering these histories necessarily frees Armenians from the marginalized periphery of history books, diasporic accounts, and nationalist renderings. It likewise reorients our gaze upon Armenians from victims to actors, irrespective of their tragic past, a statelessness, and shallow historical footprint in Lebanon. In addition, it advances the notion that Lebanon, and Beirut more specifically, was simultaneously an Armenian center as much as it had been understood as an Arab and Lebanese one. In this way, these findings contribute to and complicate studies of Lebanon, Beirut, and the Middle East region more broadly. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, I guess we, I can take some questions, if there are any. <laughs> Yeah, I did, yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. I, um, I actually uh, worked now on a, on a short story about the uh, sort of the effects of repatriation of the smaller community in Iraq. Um, and it's interesting, so the, it's, a sh it's a short story written by an Iraqi Jew describing the Armenians in Iraq. Oh, okay. Um, and the description is a community that has a very good relationship with their Jewish neighbors, but also one that is bilingual, also one that is kind of isolated, uh, also one that is haunted by the memories of the war, um, which brings me to two questions specific to the Lebanese context. One is uh, sort of how, um, how much was uh, sort of Lebanonization, if you can call it, um, effective in terms uh, of language and, and politics? So um, how does the Armenian language, how is it maintained through schooling, through the memoirs of the past? How much people kind of join other political parties that are not exclusively um, Armenian, but uh, they kind of reach out to, to others? And the, the second question that I had was about the diversity within the, the community itself. Are there, for example, tensions between Armenians who already resided in Lebanon to the sort of penniless uh, refugees that come after the genocide? Um, how is it complicated after 1948 when some Armenians come from Palestine? So you talked a little bit about the divisions based on political parties, but what about the divisions based on class, arrival to Lebanon, 
forth. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, okay, so I'll start maybe with the, the first question. Um, actually, Lebanon, I would say, was a site of Armenianization in that period, in that um, many uh, refugees who arrived didn't speak Armenian. So um, many learned Armenian in Lebanon. Um, and there were active campaigns by political parties, some relatively violent and like book burning, um, uh, that tried to force Armenians to speak Armenian and learn Armenian and stop speaking Turkish. Um, and um, yes, that was also, frankly, I would go out on a limb here a little bit to say it was also a class issue um, because it depended upon, um, you know, which uh, villages some of these Armenians had come from that were monolingual in Turkish and some which were bilingual. So I think at the point of Armenians coming, I wouldn't necessarily say, I would say it was more of an Armenianization process. Um, regarding your question about um, to what extent did they not join Armenian political parties, I think it depends on the time period. Um, so you have a pretty strong Armenian Communist Party that's allied with its uh, Lebanese and Syrian counterparts in Syria and in Lebanon, but it really depletes in the repatriation movement, right? They were the first to to sign up, but they weren't exclusively the only people that went. And they surely weren't the only political parties that encouraged them to go. The, the, right, the nationalist Dashnak party initially supported repatriation. It does change, and it changes relatively quickly. But you know, in 1946, they were pro this movement. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so you definitely had Armenians of different political persuasions, but I would argue that joining, say, Lebanese political parties comes much later. Maybe I would say 60s even. Um, so um, oh, the diversity between the community. It's not, um, you, it's not as stark as a difference at all, say, as the Armenians in Palestine, where there were actually names that the Armenians, the, the native Armenians uh, of Palestine actually called um, the, the coming Armenians, and they called each other, you know, they referred to each other differently. Um, that, I haven't found that in my work. Um, I wouldn't say that that means that it didn't necessarily happen. It might not have been just documented as such, but I would then argue it wasn't that prevalent. Um, also because the Armenians that were already there before 1915, the, the largest community wasn't in Beirut. It was a Catholic community up in the mountains of Lebanon. Um, and I think that might have something to do with it. And it wasn't as large of a community nor as historic as the, at least the Armenians in Jerusalem. I'm comparing them to, or in Egypt, yeah. Yeah. Vis-a-vis, um, -vis, um, and then I think you asked also about um, uh, the differentiation between class, right? Um, so when Armenians first arrived in Lebanon, um, in the Lebanese press, in the Lebanese Arabic press, um, you have a fair amount of um, uh, dis disdain for these refugees. Um, and you see that sort of phase out in, in articles, but what continues is uh, the, the making fun of Armenians in, um, in comics. So that continues. Um, I would say through the 30s for sure. Um, and it's it sort of tapers off a little bit by the upper 40s as well. I don't know if that's because you have you know, this idea that we have to come together as a nation state. I'm not sure. Uh, but it does taper off. And it's still sort of you see it a little bit more in the cartoon figures. And the, the figures are of. Um, of uh, uneducated, uh, um, that they can't read, um, and that they have lots of children, and they can't feed them, um, and they look, uh, they're dressed in um, sort of Ottoman clothing, like shalvars and like the peasant look, yeah. Um, and so it does, but it does, you know, change by the 40s and 50s. Again, that also matters in time because then you have editorials that are by the 50s and 60s that are also like Hassan Twaini and, and Nahad is speaking sometimes against the Armenian community in ways. So it's ebbs and flows um, as well. Yeah, it, it does depend on the time period. Yeah, thank you. Yep. I, I just follow 
into that because yeah. it's my observation that the um, on the temperature test that the um, that the cartoons often can often look contrary to the editorial <laughs> work of the papers. So that the, so the, for example, there are things that the that the editorial line of the newspaper will be promoting, and the cartoons will display skepticism and anxiety about those. So I see. Yeah. You know? so yeah. I was kind of curious if you had observed that kind of picture. Yeah. It's one thing, another thing, sort of asking about that the portrayal of the, you know, the refugees from Cilicia as, you know, impoverished and, and uneducated. Uh, to what extent is that also a commentary on Ottomans? You know, that they have the Ottoman past, that they are in, in moments and not an Ottoman past, and not a modern progressive. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so um, maybe I'll start with your last question and try to get to the first. Um, I would say it matter. Uh, there's definitely a connection, Be and I say this because in the late '50s, um, due to this inter, you know, the the intra-Armenian conflict that I talked about, and actually even a little bit before, by 1957, say by these elections that I talked about. Um, you have the um, the cartoons of the Armenian papers, especially of the leftist Hunchak paper and the right and the leftist Ramgavar paper, um, draw uh, very not very nice uh, representations of the rightist nationalist Dashnaks, and they draw them in Ottoman garb, um, and uh, and that's a reference to. Back in the Ottoman Empire, um, them working for the you know for the constitutional movement and you know being pro the the govern the the revolution, um, and so they do adopt that, um, and they adopt this tone and they it's like with the fez and everything and these uh, very um, exaggerated, yeah, caricatures. Um, so there's there's that, um, and I think that. Um, with, but I haven't necessarily seen a discrepancy between the cartoon and the editorial conflict, the content. I actually was more shocked by the cartoons. I thought they took the editorial content even further because the editorial content is nasty as well. Um, and especially by this 57, 58 period, I mean, I wouldn't say going so far as to blame the Dashnaks for the genocide, but it teeters on it. So it's pretty nasty, let alone the, the cartoons are even worse. Um, so I haven't seen that, that discrepancy. But I do think that the cartoons that I was referring to in, in Orit's question probably uh, you know, also are engaging with that same element of distancing from this Ottoman past and that we are more modern, um, for sure. Yeah, progress and the yoke of the Ottoman you know, empire and whatnot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 Please. So this follows from the point that you made about uh, Lebanon and the site of Armenianization. Uh, when the community that's repatriated in 46, 48 uh, gets to Armenia, <laughs> Soviet Armenia, how are they thinking in terms of the experience? point of other Armenians, say Iranian Armenians who have just been through the Soviet occupation of northern Iran, or Armenians in the United States, uh, what does the Lebanese experience contribute to their sense of Armenianness once they're back? Once they're Iran? back. Um, yeah, it's actually, frankly, it's a tragic story um, in that um, most I would say the vast majority of these Armenians that repatriated um, were, uh, uh, you know, have very tragic stories of that they didn't know that it was going to be this difficult. I mean, I'm I'm really minimizing, but in the memoirs, even like even what I mean by that is that even the people who were involved in the repatriation communities and really believed in this movement ideologically um, were so disappointed. 
Um, and um, so there's, there's also this part of it, that even before they interacted with other Armenians, the disappointment very quickly of getting there um, and what happened to their belongings, you know, they, first of all, they had to pay to go. Um, and once they got there, a lot of their belongings were um, claimed uh, by either Soviet authorities or Soviet Armenian authorities. Those who had um, affiliations with nationalist parties, a lot of them were taken and imprisoned. Um, and uh, many who had thought that they were going to live side by side in these new villages that were created for them, they were um, you know, on other sides of the country, which might not be a big deal now, but was certainly a big deal in the 40s. Um, about like how to access each other. And then there was another additional element of the tension of amongst Soviet Armenians that were there and the Armenians that came. Um, and then, um, yes, then you also have this issue of Armenians coming from elsewhere. Um, I don't follow, to be honest, I don't follow the repatriates very strongly when I go, when they go to Soviet Armenia because of my lack of Russian. Right, it sort of bars me. But from the memoirs that I have read, um, it is a it, it's a very tragic story. Um, but yet the Armenian and there's also codes that are adopted by Armenians that have gone and um, to the the people who remain. That I am more privy to. So, for example. Um, say you had repatriated and um, I was supposed to come on the next caravan, you would send a photo and or you would either send a photo and someone would be lying on the floor and that was code for not to come. Or in the letter you would say how is person X or, or come when person X marries and person X is two years old, right? Or, or person X is dead, right? Um, so that was the code that was adopted. Um, so you know, <laughs> yeah. So, so th there's there's this. So I'm more privy to the. I'm more aware of the tensions between the those who left and those who remained, and also amongst Soviet Armenians. But to be honest, I don't know of so much work that has been done. It would be really interesting to look at amongst the Armenians once they are there. A lot of them also left in the 70s at the first possibility of leaving. Yeah, and they had to leave to the United States because they had given up their citizenship. Right, you couldn't return to Lebanon, right? You couldn't return to Syria. That was part of the deal. You had to sell everything, and then you had to, um, you know, give your uh, citizenship. And that also, of course, um, you know, had reject like interesting effects back in Lebanon. So people had to sell quickly, many of them, because your name came up and you wanted to go, and so you left. So um, that's one of the reasons why an, Arme an older Armenian populated neighborhood like Naba, which is near Burchamud, now actually has a very strong Shia community because that was at the same time when the Shia were coming from the south to the north to look for, and it, was the, it was a movement towards the city and they actually purchased a lot of the land there because those Armenians were actually going to the Soviet Union. And that's a permanent change, I mean permanent for them, you know, they couldn't come back there. So um, there is also that tragedy as well. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much for your talk. I wanted to ask about the Kapolikos uh -huh. Yeah. For the Armenians, you didn't have an ecclesiastical stake in it, like the Protestants. Did they express concern or kind of confusion in terms of who the candidates are and how it would affect them as Armenians, but not perhaps as members of that and did they perhaps create, or was there kind of a new drawn of alliances amongst the different Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so they still participated in the spectacles <laughs> um, of welcoming this figure, um, not because they necessarily believed in his authority or necessarily they believed in the dogma, but like I mentioned that it was just such a spectacle of having this Armenian figure come and all schools were closed. So Protestant schools, Catholic schools were all closed as well. The derivative was sent to all school children to come to the streets as well and the Lebanese flag and all of that. So that was actually quite similar. Um, they still, even if they were Protestant or Catholic or another religious persuasion, were still involved um, at, or affiliated with Armenian political parties. 
So that also affected them. But so for but also for example the um, when the uh, when the economy closed. So when there was a um, uh, um, uh, strike, um, you know, and that Armenian businesses were closed and, and, and the like, um, they also participated in that as well. Yeah. There are a few articles actually in there's, there's an, there was a Protestant journal and a Catholic journal. It didn't come out every week or anything like that. It was about three weeks, sometimes every month that engaged with this. And it was more about, um, ideology. These, these figures ended up really representing political ideology. Yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. Tangential, but, uh, so in the 50s, anyway, the, the core uh, Kurdish community went to Turkey. The radio broadcasts from the Soviet Union were very important because they were in the language, uh, yeah. the music, and the news, and other things. And, um, you know, at a time when wasn't so easy to, um, it was impossible, in fact, to have uh, such things broadcasted in Turkey. But, but it also did represent a particular kind of linguistic mm -hmm. intervention uh, because the, the um, Soviet uh, press uh, promoted a particular approach to the Turkish country. I'm wondering, did you have for the Koreans that would be brought into Syria, would it be different in the sense that? <coughs> Sort of cultural push and what influence on the language? On the language. That's harder for me to answer, um, to be honest, um, because of the difference in dialect. Um, uh, from, what I from what I know, uh, I mean, the official announcement that was done for repatriation, for example, was not in um, the Soviet Armenian dialect. It was done in Western Armenian dialect, and it was broadcast um, in various cities simultaneously, including Ankara. So that's also, I mean, there, there is a meth, there is a message <laughs> being, and you know, at this time it was not clear, um, so the Soviet Union was still pressing for uh, parts of Eastern Turkey, right? So I think there's also that aspect of it. And this is also what the repatriation committee said, oh, we'll, we'll go so that then we can go there once this land becomes part of Soviet the Soviet Republic. Um, so there's um, there's there's that, but vis-a-vis -vis the language itself, I'm I'm not very aware. Um, I, I'm more aware of other efforts that the Soviet Union aided in, um, in order really to um, I think there there are various messages going on, but I think one of the messages is to reinforce its position as the authority of the Soviet Republic of Armenia, which is the homeland, like helping to organize the 50th anniversary of the genocide commemoration um, in, the so in the Soviet Republic to reorient the orbit there in 65. Um, I'm more aware of those types of activities rather than language, but it could be, I, I just, yeah, not aware of it, yep. The Shia, the Maronites, the, the Palestinians, and eventually, maybe this is unfair because this is also the, the project, but how does it fare out in the Civil War in the 70s and the 80s? Yeah, um, thank you. So um, I found interesting that they use the same word in the 40s, the Armenian press uses the same word repatriation for um, obviously for their repatriation, but also for um, Jewish immigration to Palestine, um, even so even before 48, and yet that is not okay. <laughs> but it's the same word, right? So they, they could have used it. I, I mean, there's no reason why they needed to use this word. Um, so it's something I wanna look into further. Um, because it, it can't just be this. I, I, I'm not sure if there's a double meaning going on or I'm not sure. Um, but that's how they, uh, just that's in this sort of an aside because you were more asking about the communities within um, Lebanon. Um, yeah, so I think that um, as time goes on, um, there's more and more engagement 
um, with these other communities. But to be honest, within the Armenian press, they don't articulate the sp specificities of sect in the in the at least in this period until say 1960. There's nothing that says the Shia or the Sunni. They may say Muslims. Maybe um, they, but rather they would use words like, for example, in 1950, they use opposition, um, you know, and the like. But I haven't really seen an articulation of that specific, right? Um, with regards to the Civil War, um, yeah, um, you know, there's this. Uh, they, the Armenian parties in 1975, actually right before 1975, adopted a um, positive neutrality stance. And the three political parties, and I say three because they didn't include the Communist Party, but they still um, spoke and compromised with the Communist Party, but they're not on the official sort of signatories that they wouldn't get involved in the war. Um, I mean, non-involvement's involvement first. And secondly, um, they were involved sometimes due to attacks, but also just due to the fact that they ran hospitals and, you know, and, and the like, and so they, they were certainly involved. Um, yeah, there was, uh, some, I just lost my train of thought, but um, oh, that they, if they were involved and then, um, oh, so, but my idea of why they sort of pushed for this idea, this positive neutrality, also, maybe, and I haven't really worked on this, it's just something I've started to think about, that by 1958, the inter-Armenian violence was resolved, right? So basically, I mean, I'm being crude, but basically the, the rightist Dashnak party won. So it, were, it behooved the other parties to ally with them for this positive neutrality because they're, you know, they had worked out their differences with one actually winning. And so then they had, the other two parties couldn't go off on their own. <laughs> it would have been a suicide because they had already lost and they had also lost membership from 48 and then uh, onward, right? So I think that this is why they adopted this method, um, you, know, not to, or, you know, not to actively fight. But it's something I need to, to look into more. But I think it stems from a 58 issue. Yeah. So. Thank you. <laughs>